Hello, everyone. My name is Jibby Ioanni, and I am a DevOps engineer and an AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate. I currently work out of a 50-person health tech startup in San Francisco, California, called Welkin Health. Now, what does DevOps really mean? I'll get, to, I'll get there, but for now, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background on who I am, some work I've done, and an anecdote to get to know me. I was born in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, by way of Nigerian parents. I've lived in Nigeria, England, the Marshall Islands, and many places in the United States. Now, most people I meet have never even heard of the Marshall Islands, let alone are able to point it out on a map. Well, there it is, out in the middle of the South Pacific, a few thousand miles smack dab in the middle of Hawaii and Australia. I had the pleasure of being able to live in this developing country consulting for the Marshallese government. Why? Well, have you ever seen those movies or TV shows where the bad guys are laundering money through some offshore bank account? Well, it happens in real life, and the Marshall Islands are one of the islands that it happens on, where people really launder money through um, these, the island or even finance terrorism. Um, or did anyways. As a developing country, the islands didn't have the technical means to build out a solution to ward off such criminal intent. The Government Banking Commission and the lead agency for anti-money laundering, the Marshall Islands, received financial information from the local banks turned in um, by paper, and it was inputted into a single Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. There were more than 15 years of backlogged paper documentation that needed to, manually needed to be manually inputted. No wonder it was so hard to catch the bad guys. I was a consultant for the government of the Marshall Islands to create a process for submitting these documents electronically and storing the data in a database, allowing for more th thorough analysis to track patterns in suspect activity. Currently, it assists the country in combating money laundering and terrorist financing. It feels pretty good to be a part of something so impacting. But believe it or not, I didn't start off always wanting to be a software engineer. I went to one of the top computer science undergraduate colleges in the nation, but I was studying pre-medical neuroscience. Upon reflection, I realized I was doing something wrong. So I took a couple of computer science classes and figured I could use this tool of computer science to do good, just as I wanted to use medicine to do good. So I switched majors and took hold of adding to my identity, to my life resume, software engineer. Now, something I haven't mentioned to you, something really important to me and core to my identity, is my love for dogs. <laughs> I've been quite obsessed with dogs my whole life, but there was only one problem. My mother was irrationally afraid of dogs. But, more than, but after more than two decades of begging, pleading, and nagging for a dog, the eyes of this sweet little adorable pup changed hearts that day. We took our little Riley home, and as every new dog owner knows, we captured every one of her moments on camera. <laughs> and one day after coming in from the rain, she did something quite interesting, and the camera came out. Like every good dog mom, I of course put, put it up on her Instagram page, calling on other dog parents to see if their dog was as quirky as mine. After opening my phone a couple hours later, it had blown up online. Hundreds of people had been tagged, thousands of likes, and I was in shock. Wow, I guess my Riley is uniquely quirky. 
Hours after that, a huge media company had reposted her video, and 21 million views later, we had about 20 requests in our inbox from different digital media companies asking to represent Riley and her video. And that is the day we became a dual-income household. So just for kicks, has any one person in this room actually seen this video on their own time? Yes? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you, you helped us pay rent. <laughs> so why did I tell you that story? At first, it might seem like a lighthearted scheme to get you to like me because I have an adorable dog, but really what that story is about is how social media and cloud computing make the per perfect recipe for stardom. Take it in. Can you imagine the power of social media that a dog with a couple hundred followers on Instagram, at Riley underscore the Boston Terrier, if you're interested, could blow up in a matter of hours and become known to millions around the world? That a platform like Instagram and Facebook can house the compute power to deliver content to millions of people across the world without delay? Well, welcome to the cloud the ominous cloud that we've all been migrating over to in the last 10 plus years as the industry standard calls for. We've seen the pushes from Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and companies alike. How to build your cloud strategy, accelerate results, everything you need to build and scale. But when we're all buying into the hype and no one's doubting, we can get ourselves into trouble. Can I see a show of hands? How many people interact with Amazon Web Services, the cloud service provider, um, in one way or another? Awesome. Now, everyone with your hands down, if you think you aren't a customer of Amazon Web Services, you're probably wrong. You just don't know it. Do you use Slack? Do you watch Netflix? Or do you shop on Amazon? Yeah. Well, you're interacting with AWS. How big is AWS exactly? Well, it hosts over 140,000 websites. So a large portion of this 100,000 websites were affected in the great 2017 outage of AWS. And if we didn't learn from our mistakes, they were also affected in the great 2018 outage of AWS. If your Alexa suddenly went silent or your Slack channel at work stopped working, Amazon Web Services went down. On March 2nd, 2018, between 9.23 a.m. and 1.26 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, AWS data centers in Virginia suffered downtime, affecting customers all over the East Coast of the U.S., Slack, Medium, Imgur, SoundCloud, Quora, Mashable, BuzzFeed, and thousands more sites you may need to access for work or to avoid working were impacted. I worked at a big bank and credit card company in the United States called Capital One. You might have heard of it, what's in your wallet? And customers openly vented all over Twitter of their frustrations at being unable to access their accounts. I had never seen so many people running around like chickens with their heads cut off, more than during this severity, high severity, or SEV1 incident that had backlash for months to come at my company, and more on that later. But cloud computing, yay! Now, yes, cloud computing is the next big thing to bring us to the new level of content distribution in computing. But I argue that as we as an industry move towards cloud computing as a standard to take the burden off of managing our own data centers, the standard for security and reliability to our customers do not change. So what does it look like to continue to have high standards of security and reliability as we migrate to the cloud? Well, to explain how to get there, we first have to understand the cloud. So I'm just going to take a few minutes and get us all calibrated on our understanding of the cloud. I know most of us are already way up to speed and know exactly what the cloud is, but for all my friends watching back at home who have no idea, and for those of us who think it's too late at this point to ask, but this is a safe space. There's no such thing as a stupid question. You don't believe me? Okay. Well, let me share this, even the playing field a little bit. 
Most Americans were confused by cloud computing according to a national survey in 2012. Fair six years in the tech world is, is quite a while, but some cloud fun facts for you. Did you know that 51% of people believe stormy weather has an effect on cloud computing? 29% of people think the cloud has something to do with the weather. And 95% of people have used the cloud but don't know it. Now, these facts are pretty hilarious, and it also goes to show how ubiquitous the cloud actually is and how little people really knew about it. But we've come a long way. So what is the cloud? Well, what if I told you there is no cloud? It's just someone else's computer. Shocking, I know. Now, hold this thought, and we'll come back to this in a second. I'll tell you a little bit about my personal experience with the cloud. When I was working at my first job out of college, that bank, Capital One, I kept hearing that we were migrating to the cloud from our, our on-site data centers. But um, they said that it would save us cost and make us more secure, but what did that actually look like, migrating to the cloud? Definitely nothing at all like it sounded. So I, of course, go to Google, and I looked up the cloud service providers and waded through the, the pool of buzzword extravaganzas, and the answers I got, simply put, were delivery of computing services. So they gave me virtually nothing. And after digging a little further, and as I continued to um, get into the weeds of things, I started to get a more well-rounded answer of what this migration to the cloud actually looked like. And it was more than just throwing our data centers into the cloud. Imagine this. We are a little startup with a limited budget hosting its own data centers, paying for the costs of these physical data centers, building costs, security guards, and the expertise to maintain it all. Of course, people are the most expensive asset. Money we don't have. And not only are we paying for the power and storage that we currently use, but we're also paying for the potential of power and storage that we anticipate we'll need in the future because we will inevitably go viral and need to handle the traffic of our millions of users. And since it can take weeks to acquire and rack new equipment to handle such spikes, we have to provision them in advance. And heaven forbid we overestimate and pay for all of that extra unused capacity on the top or underestimate and risk creating a poor customer experience when the demand on the application exceeds its capacity. While the cost of over-provisioning is eas easily measured, the cost of under-provisioning is more difficult to measure, yet potentially equally ser serious. Not only do rejected users generate zero revenue, they may never come back. So we're this little startup. We're juggling all of these costs. Then AWS swoops in and says they can take away all of that hassle. The costs of physical and online security power and take away the biggest financial burden of the expertise to maintain these servers. All we have to do is simply pay for what we use. And to throw us a bone, they guarantee that they can handle the spike in usage when we surely and inevitably go viral, as every startup does, like my dog and I. All through the cloud. So I bring us back to this concept of using someone else's computer. In this context, what is the cloud and what is cloud computing? Well, instead of taking the burden off of, of, of housing networks, servers, and storage for myself as a company, I hand that burden over to these cloud service providers like AWS. OK, so we have our calibrated answer of the nebulous cloud computing question, not to be confused with nebulous clouds. Is for me as a developer, a cost-effective and convenient access to resources allowing me to rapidly source, uh, rapidly serve my customers. So cloud computing is essentially just me renting space on physical servers that Amazon maintains in a data center somewhere that I don't even know about. So let's take a real-life example to really drive home this definition. I'm sure you've all heard of this amazing sport called football. 
No, not, not that football. American football. I know, I know Americans. <laughs> well, every year we have this big championship game um, of the National Football League. I'm sure you've heard of the Super Bowl. A funny little thing about the Super Bowl is millions of people nationwide and potentially even worldwide have never actually watched football during the season until this big game because it's an incredible marketing opportunity where companies will invest millions to get a 30 to 90 second commercial slot. Companies will fight for these slots, not only with money, but also with content, creating incredibly funny, quirky, and subliminally suggestive commercials for the world to see. I don't always watch the Super Bowl, but when I do, it is for the commercials. The Super Bowl is undoubtedly the biggest American television event of the year. But about 100 million people per year will tune in on this, this Super Bowl to watch the best commercials of the year. Seriously, I've been entertained for hours YouTubing best Super Bowl commercials. But one commercial in particular caught the eyes of Super Bowl fans during last year's 52nd NFL conference. Turn your eyes to the screen to watch this 90 second commercial of what fans viewed last year. hanging, I know. Unfortunately, we can't watch the remaining of the six-minute video here, but I do implore you to check it out after this talk. But as you can imagine, within one minute of this commercial airing, the website received more than 300,000 hits, enough to slow down the load time and display a service unavailable visit uh, message to the visitors. 84 Lumber, the 61-year-old lumber company that created this commercial, said the site was only able to serve 150,000 requests per minute. And that, took, that issue took about 10 minutes to resolve. During that timeline, the company redirected users to YouTube while they got their site restored. After one hour, the site had received more than 6 million requests to load an expensive mistake for the $15 million the company paid to have this 90-second slot by failing to prepare the hosting foundation of their website, though quickly resolving the issue. Another more relatable example, following a riveting Super Bowl halftime performance by Coldplay and Bruno Mars, a commercial aired announcing Beyonce will be going on a world tour as a result, the site had succumbed to the power of the Bayhive and her website crashed. A simple answer to issues like this is to require a website hosting solution that can stretch its capacity to accommodate a sudden spike of traffic. Now that we see one of the many use cases of the need of cloud computing, a cloud-based platform, we can use these few examples for the purpose of today to say, okay, Okay, we agree on the definition of cloud computing. We, we don't want to have the dreaded 503, 504 errors. We'll get on the cloud. We'll buy into the hype. 
we will get on the cloud. So what now? We've handed over all this responsibility to the all-knowing Amazon Web Services. Well, remember a few minutes ago when we saw what it looked like to hand over all that responsibility to AWS? Yeah, you had forgotten, hadn't you? Well, I implore you to remember that as the industry moves towards cloud computing as a standard to take the burden off of managing our own data centers, the standards for security and reliability to our customers do not change. So what does that mean for me? As I mentioned initially, I'm a DevOps engineer. And what does that mean? Well, it's a combination of software development and software operations. It includes everything from infrastructure management to improving automation and monitoring of all steps of software construction. DevOps ultimately means building digital pipelines that take code from a developer's laptop to uh, all the way to production. So as the cloud becomes the industry standard, my job is to manage the infrastructure in the cloud and make sure the utilization of it is more efficient. I work with teams to migrate to the cloud and move towards a more reliable and secure standard. When I start to work with the team, understanding where the current infrastructure is and where we want to be is incredibly important. Starting at the very basics, we all may have gotten an instance or two up and running on AWS and even gotten it to serve content. And what's next? Well, we want to go from something like this, having an instance up and running that the developer or customer can connect to directly, to something like this. We want to bring our application and utilization of the cloud to maturity, to higher standards. To leverage AWS for its abilities to support higher standards in application development, I want to highlight a few key items from this architecture that I've seen in my tenure using AWS. Auto-scaling groups, load balancers, security patching, and disaster recovery. These are a few items that I've personally worked with on, um, when t moving teams to higher reliability and resiliency. So let's tackle the concept of auto-scaling groups. What are they? Well, as we saw in the earlier example for any company that goes viral, side note, my dog and I can give you some tips. We'll talk after. But rapid elasticity of web servers is imperative. Now, the keys here are automation, scalability, and rapidity. In the ideal infrastructure, there need not be human intervention, as we remember in the case of our lumberjack friends swinging the axe too little too late. Also, the virtual limitless scale upon which your servers are able to handle any amount of traffic is core to your reliability. And the speed of which that scale out and scale in happens not only saves us as developers our time, our, our um, company's money and offer our customers reliability to return to our product. AWS addresses all of these key points with its solution of auto-scaling groups. Auto-scaling groups are a collection of in instances or servers treated as a logical grouping to perform similar operations. For example, if a single application operates across multiple instances, you might want to increase the number of instances in that group to improve the performance of the application or decrease the number of instances to reduce the cost when demand is low. Now, to help us understand, a colleague made a brilliant analogy of auto-scaling groups to rabbits. I know. Well, let me explain. Rabbits are small, cute, and fluffy but they are in no way predators, which is why natural selection has favored the most high-strung and skittish of them all to survive. Any inkling of danger in Peter Rabbit's second cousin twice removed is out of there, while Peter is left to de defend for himself against the big bad wolf. Well, like rabbits, auto-scaling groups can detect a specific condition and react swiftly. The group, can, the group set can automatically scale in response to load increases and decreases. So when danger is sensed or a sudden spike in traffic is sensed, um, millions more users are hitting your site, and AWS automatically provisions more instances. You won't even realize you've gone viral until you decide to check the utility of your instances, or of course you have monitoring set up to, to tell you of such a circumstance. 
Well, AWS charges by the hour for the number of instances you occupy. So when this sudden spike goes down, it can also decrease the number of instances to reduce costs when demand is low. You can use scaling policies to increase or decrease the number of instances in your group dynamically to meet changing conditions. When the scaling policy is in effect, the auto-scaling group detects these slight changes and adjusts the desired capacity of the group to launch or terminate instances when needed. Instances may need to be launched when CPU utilization reaches a certain threshold or even terminated and replaced if instances become unhealthy. What does it mean for an instance to be unhealthy? All instances in your auto-scaling group start in a healthy state. Instances are assumed to be healthy unless the auto-scaling group receives notification from the instances themselves, a load balancer, or a customized health check that they are unhealthy. If the instance status is in any other state than running, the auto-scaling group marks the instance as unhealthy, tears it down, and launches a replacement. Overall, auto-scaling groups allow you to build with fault tolerance, so even if one instance goes down, another can be launched immediately to compensate. It gives better availability, ensuring your application has the right amount of capacity to handle the current traffic demand, and better cost management, paying only for what is used. Now we move on to load balancing. We have this logical group of servers processing our requests and the instances within the auto-scaling group, yet we need to know which instances at any point in time are actually going to process a specific request. We also need to make sure one instance isn't taking all of the requests and there is an equal balance amongst all the healthy instances. Imagine this, you're in a foreign country and your wallet gets stolen and you need to call your credit card company to cancel your card and get a replacement. You find the customer support number and you're prompted to press one to check your balance or two for a lost or stolen card. You press two and after what feels like 17,000 hours on hold, you're speaking to a customer service rep to cancel your card and get you a replacement. Now the phone system that did the work to find an available rep to answer your call serves a nearly identical function as a load balancer. The credit card company has to keep track of how many re representatives are available to receive a call and which reps are going to take the call. It needs to be able to notice when a rep is on a lunch break and not picking up, so it can redirect calls before the caller gets annoyed and hangs up. It needs to use the right algorithm to make sure that the calls get answered as quickly as possible without burning out every rep in the call center. A load balancer, likewise, needs to keep track of how many servers are available to receive incoming requests by periodic health checks. It needs to be able to notice when a server isn't responding to a connection so it can mark the server as unresponsive, as unhealthy, and pick another server before the request times out. It also needs to pick an efficient algorithm to make sure the servers are handling um, optimal number of requests. The basic idea is the same in both cases. One destination that the world uses to reach the resource balanced between many backend resources that can handle the incoming load. When I was at Capital One, load balancers and auto-scaling groups allowed one of my teams to handle the spike in traffic when our vice president of engineering of a 40,000 person company accidentally emailed a link of our internal tool to a widespread audience within the company. Now, our tool usually had a maximum of 500 visitors per day, but on this day, we were thankful we put in place load balancers and auto-scaling groups to handle this unexpected stardom. We have our auto-scaling groups and our load balancers addressing the reliability layer to support our customers, but how do we address security? Well, we have all of these instances that are taking our requests, but they are now being managed by someone else. Our instances are running on pre-configured templates called Amazon Machine Images, or AMIs, provided by AWS. These AMIs provide the information required to launch an instance, including the operating system and the application server. AWS provides different types of AMIs, Linux and Windows, with common software configurations for public use, or customers can create custom images. 
AWS provides ongoing security maintenance updates to all instances running on a, um, Amazon Linux and provides fully patched Windows AMIs within five business days of Microsoft's Patch Tuesdays, the second Tuesday of each month. Well, why five days after? Well, these Patch Tuesdays have promptly led to recall Thursdays with various breaking patches affecting the functionality of Windows and even resulting in complete system crashes. So Amazon likes to give Windows a little bit of time to recover. To ensure we have the latest security updates, we need to manually patch these instances when Amazon rolls out with these updates to start new instances with the latest patches. But what if we just didn't update our instances? Well, let's take a real life example. In June 2015, the United States Government Office of Personnel Management, OPM, announced that it had been the aim of a data breach, targeting the records of as many as four million people. The final estimate, the number of stolen records, 21.5 million. It's been described by federal officials as amongst the largest breaches of government data in the US history. OPM had no IT security until 2013. They failed to manage an inventory list of all of its servers and databases, and they didn't even know all the systems that were connected to its networks. This enormous hack was easily preventable by keeping up to date with security patches needed for their servers. Now, I told you I worked at a health tech company, so you can imagine the heavy regulation and need for intensive security to prevent a hack like this on protected health information. Well, let me give you a little background of my current job. At Welkin, we believe healthcare is broken and we want to fix it. Why wait until your car stops running to visit the mechanic if all it needed was an oil change to prevent disrepair. Unfortunately, this is exactly what happens in healthcare. Financial incentives and poor process design are failing patients. However, the financial structure of the industry is shifting to promote preventative care. Welkin is a tool for adding value to care and making it more efficient. We remove the software obstacles to the healthcare system to improve care delivery. We build a better way for patients and health professionals to communicate and coordinate. One shorthand way of talking about what Welkin software is, is that we are a batteries included CRM for healthcare. Care delivery companies need CRM software to make their health programs run effectively and we hope to make the world a better place by empowering health organizations to deliver patient-centered care. I love my job. The people, the organization, our mission. Moving to healthcare sec sector allowed me to get back to my first passion, medicine. I've always wanted to do good in some way, and at Welkin, I get to help create a product that facilitates long-term sustainable medical care for patients. Our software makes healthcare work better for both sides of the patient program relationship. For health professionals, our platform can be configured to support their program and business needs, which they can use to connect with patients in a meaningful way. And for patients, our software is patient-centered. It respects patient preferences, and the user view itself revolves around the patient profile. With Welkin, the patient experience doesn't come at the expense of healthcare. It drives it. So if you're looking for a job, we're hiring. To help me explain, I have this awesomely corny skit um, if you turn your eyes to the screen. Hi, I'm Jasmine. I'm a program director that helps patients manage their complex chronic diseases. Our team supports a ton of patients to help them achieve lasting, healthy results. I love my job, but this work needs to stay organized and sometimes there's just too much. There's gotta be something that can help our coaches through their workday, ensuring our patients won't slip through the cracks. Hi, I'm Welkin. I think I can help. Tell me more, Welkin. I know exactly which patients your coaches need to talk to today. All they have to do is sign in and I'll tell them what to do. Your coach's work is organized and patients get the right care at the right hmm, time. That's, that's cool. Uh, can you do anything else? Ask me anything. All right. Um, 
Uh, let's say there's a patient named Isabel and she has type 1 diabetes. What if her glucose monitor could actually talk to the tools so our coaches would know when they need to check in? Were you just talking about me? <laughs> uh, I, I think so. Do you know Welkin? Oh yes, we go way back. We talk all the time. It's true. I'm super friendly with pretty much any device. Anything Gloria tells me, I store that data and alert Isabel's coach when she needs support. Oh, that would be so helpful. You're telling me that's a huge relief. Isn't that what you always said you wanted, Steve? Ahem. Steve? Oh, hi. Hi, Steve. Let me get this straight. So Welkin can tell me when patients like Isabel need support, and I could contact them and help them manage what's going on so the burden doesn't fall on them to figure this stuff out on their own. Exactly. Exactly. See, adorably corny. <laughs> Um, you can see that at Welkin, we care about the patient experience, and our software was designed for patient relationships. So we take our healthcare um, compliance very seriously, and that includes protecting their health information. Not to mention we have to be HIPAA compliant, the U.S. legislation safeguarding medical information through data privacy and security provisions. Which brings us back to security patching. Not, not too long ago, Welkin was using precious dev time to manually patch on a weekly basis. As the first DevOps hire, I was able to migrate us onto AWS's automated solution for patching, systems manager patch management. So instead of us owning the process of patching manually on a weekly basis, we give AWS temporary access during a scheduled maintenance window that we decide to patch our instances for us. The benefits of patch management is that it helps us save time, reduce costs, and improve our security posture by helping prevent configuration drift from the specified system policies. Plus, it's at no additional co cost, so you can implement it tomorrow. Now, the caveat with automating patching is that you're essentially allowing a deployment to happen with your back turned, which is risky, yet we want automation. It's important to weigh these balances for what is priority to your team when deciding between fully automating, utilizing the scheduled maintenance window for a completely hands-off approach, or semi-automation, using scheduled deployments to initiate patch management with the script so you're able to monitor any changes or potentially break in cha breaking changes. Our solution at Welkin is using both. Automation for our dev and QA environments and semi-automation for production. Well, folks, that brings me to my last point, disaster recovery. I have a news flash for you. Failure is not an option. It's a fact. Failure is inevitable. It allows us to grow, recognizing that there is no such thing as a perfect system. Even if there were, there are always external influences that impede the integrity of our perfect system. For instance, remember when I shared those figures on cloud fun facts? And we all laughed at those 51% of people who believed stormy weather had an effect on cloud computing? Well, they're not wrong. The weather is actually an important factor when it comes to thinking about cloud computing. One of the first things you do when you open up the AWS console is you choose a region, what region you're going to be in. You're probably familiar with AWS regions, but let me give you a refresher. A region is a geographic area where AWS has data centers. Each region has two or more availability zones, which are independent data centers that are located close enough to each other. Availability zones are used for redundancy and also for data replication. For services such as EC2 instances, you can choose which Amazon, uh, availability zone you want your instance to be launched in. As of today, there are 18 public regions across the world, but not all regions are created equally. They vary in cost, performance, and numbers of availability zones. Not only that, but they differ in natural, natural disasters based off the region of that world. Of the world. 
With every region comes different environmental factors that you also need to take in account when building out your cloud solution with fault tolerance. In California, we have earthquakes. In Northern Virginia, tropical storms and hurricanes. Remember when those AWS data centers in Virginia went down? Well, they isolated the issue to connectivity problems at data centers. A network facility lost power after the Washington DC area experienced extremely high wind gusts. At Capital One, after receiving so much backlash from this incident, it pushed a huge campaign to an already ongoing process of increasing our fault tolerance. But this incident caused all hands to double down and ensure a fault like this did not happen again. I repeat, failure is inevitable. As a result, we have to plan for failure at every level and design a system that gracefully handles it when it does occur. We were able to use this incident to push our standards higher for every single customer facing application to have a disaster recovery plan. What does this look like? Well, I bring us back to this architecture that I showed you before. We can see our auto scaling groups, load balancers, patch manager, but where does disaster recovery fit in? Well, we're only seeing part of the picture, and to build out our infrastructure with disaster recovery plan, you need to build by rec replicating data across regions. We'll look at a simplified version of this example for the sake of visibility. So you have the same load balancers, but now you see the architecture replicated across two regions using Amazon's Route 53 domain name system to route traffic. Essentially, Route 53 connects users' requests to infrastructure running in AWS, in this case, the load balancers. You can configure health checks for your resources and Route 53 responds to DNS queries using only the healthy resources. For example, suppose your website, RileyTheBostonTerrier.com, is hosted on six servers, three each in two data centers around the world. You can configure Route 53 to check the health of those servers and to respond to the DNS queries for RileyTheBostonTerrier.com using only servers that are currently healthy. If a disaster is in fact, if a disaster actually happens and one of the data centers goes down, it should have little to no effect to your customer. Route 53 can detect that it's unhealthy and stop including it when responding to the DNS queries. Now, this is an expensive, this is expensive to essentially double the cost of your infrastructure by building out the strategy. This is considered an active, active failover solution when you want to have all of your app instances in the regions available simultaneously. This is for the applications that cannot afford to lose connectivity like a health tech company managing ongoing patients or a bank with customers who need to have access to their money at any point in time. Because the team that I worked for in Capital One managed an internal tool, we were on a lower priority implementation of disaster recovery, an active standby approach, where we build out the capability to deploy to another region within a recovery time of one hour as opposed to the zero minutes as the active active approach calls for. This allowed for us to have the skeleton built out in our deployment scripts. So in the event of a regional failure or a data center going down, we have the capabilities to spin up in a different working region within an hour. These are just a few options of implementing a disaster recovery plan and what I've seen firsthand from failures and recoveries. Now, I did say failure is a fact. But one thing I've always learned is that the failure doesn't have to be my own for me to learn from it. So from all that I've gone through, let this, power, this, this talk empower you to push your infrastructure in the cloud to higher standards. When we look at the cloud, there are always strategies that we, will, we can build upon to improve our security and reliability. And that's really what I and my dog wanted to advocate to you today. Thank you very much.
I do have a couple minutes for questions, if, if anyone has any questions. Yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. So if I'm understanding your question, you're saying in the active standby um, approach, do you have to hard code the AMIs? No, so in the deployment of the instances, the AMIs are already on your instances when you're deploying. So it's not hard coded, but in terms of having the standby approach where your instances are in another region and you want to be able to pull that up within the hour, you are you are pulling whatever the latest AMI is that Amazon has deployed. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much.